Well, good morning, everybody. As you make your way in, welcome to Hillcrest Baptist Church. Let's begin the service by standing together. If you want to take your songbooks, turn to Psalm 194, or you can look to the screens. Psalm 194, since Jesus came into my heart, we've got a reason to smile, a reason to sing this morning. And so let's worship our Savior together. What a wonderful change. What a wonderful change in my life has been wrought Since Jesus came into my heart I have light in my soul for which long I had sought Since Jesus came into my heart Since Jesus came into my heart since Jesus came into my heart Floods of joy o'er my soul like the sea billows roll Since Jesus came into my heart Cease from my wandering I have ceased wandering and going astray Since Jesus came into my heart and my sins, which were many, are all washed away Since Jesus came into my heart Since Jesus came into my heart Since Jesus came into my heart Floods of joy o'er my soul like the sea billows roll Since since Jesus came into my heart I'm possessed of a hope that is steadfast and sure Since Jesus came into my heart Clouds of doubt now my pathway obscure Since Jesus came into my heart Since Jesus came into my heart since Jesus came into my heart floods of joy o'er my soul like the sea billows roll since Jesus came into my heart let's sing together on that last I shall go there to dwell in that city I know since Jesus came into my heart And I'm happy, so happy as onward I go Since Jesus came into my heart Sing it, church! Since Jesus came into my heart Since Jesus came into my heart Floods of joy o'er my soul like the sea billows roll Since Jesus came into my heart Great singing this morning. You may be seated. And thank you so much for your, your wonderful singing. I know it's hot outside, it's summertime, but you're singing like you're excited to be in church this morning. And you're excited that Jesus came into your heart and we sure are glad that you came into the doors of Hillcrest Baptist Church this morning. Thank you for being here. I want to welcome all those watching via live stream as well. And if you're visiting with us today, thank you so much for coming. We are sure are a privilege to have you with us. Counting an honor to have you worship with us this morning as well. Church family, as you look down through the bulletin, you'll see there's a number of things that are happening this week, a number of announcements. But I also want to call your attention to the front table here. As you see, we have a beautiful display of roses that have been uh, given and, and set in front of the church here. And uh, they are have been given in honor of an anniversary that is celebrated today, uh, given by Brother Paul Schwenke, uh, as he and Miss Kathy celebrate their 41st wedding anniversary today. So, Miss Kathy, would you mind just standing there? I'll get embarrassed you. There we go. Let's congratulate them. Brother Schwenke is preaching this morning over in Tennessee, uh, but uh, doing a wonderful job as a husband and reminding us, you know, he sets the bar really high, doesn't he? That's how they made it to 41 years right there. Uh, but, but we sure are congratulatory to you as well, and, and uh, I wish you a happy anniversary today. 
And church family, also you'll find uh, that this week is a very, very exciting week. We have a number of different things going on with our Vacation Bible School starting up this week. And uh, we have a, uh, you'll see, uh, we'll make some, some other, uh, uh, call attention to that at the end of the service. But I will say there is a, a brief uh, very brief workers meeting right after the service this morning. And so if you'd like to volunteer, help out in any way this uh, Friday, Saturday, or Sunday night, then please, if you could see me, we'll meet just right down here, right in this front section here. Won't take very long. Just want to get everybody on the same page and explain uh, what's going on and where you can help. And so that'll be after the service this morning. And then you'll also notice tonight we're asking from, for some assistance as well as we have... Some goodie bags that look like this. They have our, our church logo on it. Our, uh, our Vacation Bible School starts out on Friday night, but on Thursday night, we're having a wonderful event for our community at a uh, trampoline park down on 59th Avenue and Bell Road. Uh, Stratosphere Adventure Park is what it is. And so uh, the church that's, that's coming to help with this, they've enabled us to uh, hand out uh, free admission and pizza and things of that nature. And so we have uh, 100 kids who are registered to come and participate there in that activity. Activity Thursday night, and we also want to give them one of these goodie bags. And so it's going to have uh, just a number of items: uh, a frisbee with our church on it, some coloring, some crayons, some some gospel materials, some invitations to our church, invitations to a vacation Bible school. Uh, but we need some help assembling these. And so a very abbreviated service tonight. Just going to sing maybe one song and get right to the message, and then uh, spend some time with the Lord, and then kind of just set it up assembly line style there in the back. And so if you can help us tonight, six o'clock after our is when our evening service begins, and then following that, uh, we'll try to get these stuffed in a timely fashion. I know it's just a wonderful opportunity to be a blessing to our community and introduce our church, perhaps, to a lot of folks. And, uh, it, it, you know, you give away free pizza and free uh, trampoline park for 90 minutes. People come running, and we just have a wonderful opportunity to share Jesus with them this week. And so we'll call some other uh, attention to some announcements and some changes in the schedule following the service. But at this time, we're going to keep the service moving. And so we invite you to stand together with us one more time as we sing this next song. We are singing about Jesus coming into our heart. That's the day we experienced his wonderful love. It's found on page 185 in our songbooks, or you can look to the screens, My Savior's Love, page 185. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. For me it was in the garden, he prayed not my will but thine. He had no tears for his own griefs, but sweat drops of blood for mine. Marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. Let's sing the third. He took my sins and my sorrows. He made them his very own. He bore the burden to Calvary and suffered and died alone. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. When with the ransomed in glory, his face I at last shall see. My joy through the ages to see of his love for me. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how 
is my Savior's love for me. One of the wonderful things about experiencing Christ's love is that you have a kindred spirit one with another. And so at this time, I'm going to ask the piano to continue to play. Take a brief moment, find someone close by you, give them a friendly handshake, welcome them to church this morning, and we'll come back and keep singing here in just a moment. As you find your way back to your places this morning, continue standing with us as we sing about our Savior's wonderful love. There's only one way that you can describe it. It's wonderful. It's amazing. When we sing this wonderful song, Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound, we'll sing all four stanzas, page 244, page 244, or look to the screens, Amazing Grace, Saved a Soul Like Me. I'm looking forward to that day. We get, the Bible says, to be around uh, every tribe, every kindred, every tongue, just thousands and thousands and thousands of people uh, unified, singing together in that heavenly choir. I think it's going to sound something just like that. Y'all did a wonderful job singing this morning. You know, for summertime, uh, in past, we, you know, we, Memorial Day last weekend, had a wonderful crowd here, and, and we sure are blessed to have a great crowd here this morning and visitors with us. Thank you so much for being here, and the reason we get to sing so wonderfully and sing so loud it's because of that grace that was given to us and the wonderful love Jesus showed us when he died for us on the cross and so before we go any further in our worship service I invite you just to bow your head with me for a word of prayer and let's thank him for what he's already done for us and let's ask him to continue helping us in our service today Heavenly Father we come before you this morning we're just so grateful to come before you and worship you Lord, uh, your word tells us that uh, worship is, is more than just songs. It's more than just a, an emotion. Lord, worship is giving you the honor and glory that you deserve. 
And so in everything we do in this service, God, we sing to you today from our hearts because you're worthy to be praised. You sent your son Jesus to, to pay a price he did not deserve to pay, but he was gracious enough and loving enough to die on the cross for us and, and rise again. If that's all that was ever given to us, that'd be more than we deserve. And yet we continue singing together. We continue uh, giving to you of our, our finances, of our time, and of our, our, our talents and serving you. Because God, not just have you given to us salvation, you've given us that amazing grace on a daily basis. Grace to get up and face trials, to, to face another day. Grace to overcome temptations. And you give us your word, Lord, to study and to, to encourage us and to equip us. And so we just pause during this part of our worship service and we thank you, God, for who you are. Thank you for wonderful, matchless grace that you bestowed upon us. And I pray for the remainder of our worship service as we prepare to open up your word and, and see truths that can help us, that our response would be pleasing to you that we'd give you the, deten the attention you deserve and the response you deserve because you and your word changes our lives. I pray, Lord, that you be honored and that you be blessed in the remainder of our service. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you so much. Please be seated.
Amen. I sure am glad Jesus loves me, aren't you? Jesus loves you too. Jesus loves everybody. And no matter uh, how old they are, what skin color they are, what language they speak, where they come from, Jesus loves everybody and wants to save everybody. And that's why we're doing what we're doing this week, is we get to share that message with many, many children and many families this coming week. Sure, I'm grateful for that. Thank you for that wonderful reminder and song, Miss Leanne. Let's take your, our Bibles at this time, if we could, please. And I invite you to turn to the book of 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy in the New Testament. We've been uh, finished, we finished a study through uh, 1 Thessalonians not too long ago, last Sunday. And so if you remember where that is, you can find 2 Timothy. It will be right behind that there shortly. Let me say while you're turning there, uh, I want to uh, publicly give a word of thank you. And uh, just say, Brother Armando, would you mind just raising your hand back there? Brother Armando manning our sound table today, our, our camera table. Our, our video. He's kind of wearing multiple hats today and doing a wonderful job with it. Uh, Brother Armando came uh, over to the States from the Philippines beginning of the year and was here to be with uh, his sister, is going through, uh, recovering from some, some surgery, and uh, was typed in his computer one day, uh, Hillcrest, uh, to watch his church from the Philippines, and Hillcrest, our church, came up. And so that's, that's how he came to find our church and has been uh, just faithfully attending ever since the beginning of this year. And uh, this might be, I don't, I don't want to jinx it, I don't want to say it, this might be the uh, final time that we get to be with him. We're still uh, per, uh, pursuing perhaps some avenues for uh, him to maybe stay in the States a little longer, uh, but the temporary visa may uh, 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 enable him, uh, mandate that he goes back. This might be the final service that we have. And so uh, we're, we're praying, obviously, kind of selfishly that we can get that extended possibly. Uh, but if not, if this is the final service we have with you, then uh, Brother Armando, I want to publicly say you, sir, have been a tremendous, tremendous blessing to our church. And thank you for your sweet spirit. And uh, let, let's thank him so much. Thank you. Thank you for your faithfulness and being on board. He, he's helped us get our live stream stuff straightened out numbers of times and just, just jumped in. If you need somebody back here, Pastor, what, what, what can I do? And just that's the spirit we all ought to have. And so thank you. Hope that, that has rubbed off on us. I hope that continues to rub off on us. And uh, so if this, uh, I hope we get to hang on to you a little more. Uh, but if not, you will be missed and you have been a blessing in the time that you've been here. That's for sure. 2 Timothy chapter 4, uh, with the Lord's help over the next few Sundays, we're, we're going to bring some uh, different types of, of messages than what we uh, perhaps normally would bring on a Sunday morning. Uh, normally, we would work our way through a book, uh, line upon line, uh, verse by verse. And we do that because of its numerous benefits. I mean, when you just go verse by verse, you, you preach the whole Bible that way. I mean, when it's an, an encouraging passage and a promise from the Lord, hey, we, we preach on that. And then when the, the passage deals with sin or is a command or even a, a rebuke that we need, we, we preach that. We preach the whole Bible that way. And yet God always uses what's next in the passage to reach us right where we are in that moment. And sometimes, depending on what it is you're studying, going verse by verse can lend to a rather deeper study. You know, for example, on Sunday nights, in our Sunday night service, we've been going through the book of Daniel. And beginning tonight, we'll start looking at the last half of the book, or the last five chapters or so. It all deals with prophecy in future events. And so if you're uh, interested in prophecy and, and cor how it correlates with revelation and what are we seeing uh, uh, in today's world, in today's culture, then you're going to want to come back on Sunday nights this summer because we'll be working our way through that section. But I'll just say also pray for your pastor as well. As that's a rather deeper material to get through. And, and so knowing our Sunday night preaching time will involve some heavier material over the summer. And also uh, recognizing the physical c condition of our church this time of year. I mean, summer hits, and boy, at, at some point, we're all ready for a vacation, aren't we? I mean, we, we, whether it's the higher temperatures or whether, you know, setting up and tearing down every single Sunday, and uh, we're ready to, to take a weekend, ready to take a week, uh, go up to the mountains, uh, escape the 115-degree weather. I'm looking forward to doing that with my family here in about a month or so. Uh, and so knowing these things, I, I like to take the next few weeks, Lord willing, and preach what might be considered a more topical study. As we turn to numerous passages and look at what the Bible says concerning one topic. Now each week, the topics will deal with this thought, summer temptations. Summer temptations. Things that 
for whatever reason, we, we find ourselves being more susceptible to because it is summertime. And the first one we want to deal with today is this. In summer, we can be inconsistent. In summertime, summertime can lend itself to inconsistency. Well, inconsistent in what? Well, believe it or not, inconsistency can show up across the board in our lives. And the Bible speaks a great deal about this in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. And so we're starting out in 2 Timothy chapter 4 today, really just to establish this thought. And if you received a bulletin this morning, there should be an outline in there. Thank you, ushers, for passing those out. I invite you to follow along with me as we'll be looking at some verses that are typed out there for you, but also we'll be turning and looking at a number of passages as well. And so we're starting in 2 Timothy chapter 4. The Bible says in verse number 1, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. So just in verse 1, that's a good reason for us to be consistent and faithful, knowing one day we will stand before the Lord, won't we? Knowing that God is keeping a record of our lives and we will be accountable to him. He says in verse number 2, he says to Timothy, preach the word... Notice this phrase, be instant, in season, out of season. So Paul tells Timothy to be instant. Now that's, that's not the instant as in the mashed potatoes that I threw in the oven when I was a bachelor and before I got married. I mean, throw them in the microwave, you add some water and, and maybe some salt and pepper and something quick and easy and kind of nonchalant. That's not what instant's referring to. Notice when Paul, when, uh, or notice the word instant there, it means to be at hand, to be ready, to be in our place. Notice when Paul tells Timothy he is to be in his place, be instant, be ready in your place. He says, in season and out of season. Or as the terms literally mean, seasonably or unseasonably. When you think of items that are seasonable in our culture as, as those which are accepted, those which are more easily accessible because they are in season. Uh, for example, pumpkin spice flavoring in the fall. That's one of my wife's, that is my wife's favorite time of year because she loves pumpkin spice things. Uh, peppermint and eggnog in the winter. Tank tops and kiddie pools in the summer. I mean, you, you don't see the pumpkin spice normally throughout the summertime. Truthfully, you know, I don't know how any God-fearing Christian would put any kind of pumpkin spice into their body. But that's just a different kind of topic right there. I, just, I, I don't like pumpkin spice. But you don't see a, a peppermint in those things in the summertime. You, you don't see a, a, a heavy coats uh, this time of year unless you walk in the gym and it's freezing cold on a Sunday morning. But things that are in season, seasonable, readily accepted, easily available. And so watch what he says. Timothy, be in your place. Notice, demonstrate a level of faithfulness when it's easy to do it and when it's not so easy. That's the charge of verse number two. Demonstrate a level of faithfulness. You know what that tells us, church? That means in certain seasons of life, it will be more difficult to obey than others. Why is that the case? I believe it's because of the circumstances that surround that season. You know, in Timothy's case here, in the context, the more difficult seasons of obedience for him, it revolved the response to his ministry. In fact, look at what Paul says in verse number 3. For... Or we say because he's, he's given the reason behind the charge in verse number 2. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. They shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. So Paul says to Timothy, listen, be ready. Be in your place. Preach the word. Do your job regardless of when it's easy, regardless of when it's difficult, regardless of the response, 
because he says there's going to come a day, and we're seeing that even in our day, aren't we? And he says people are going to turn away from the truth. They're just going to want what he says, itching ears of, oh, wow, that, that, that feels good. Like you'd scratch the ears on your, your, your pet there of, give me a feel-good, encouraging message. Don't necessarily give me the truth that I need to hear, but give me what I want to hear that makes me feel good. And Paul says, I still want you to be in your place. In verse number 5, he says, But watch thou in all things. Endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. Make full proof of thy ministry. He said, Timothy, I want you to keep being an overseer. Keep watch over all things. Be a shepherd. Even when, it's, uh, even when uh, uh, people are responding well, even when they're not responding well, do what God's called you to do. Keep preaching and witnessing and pointing people to Christ. Keep putting the gifts God's given you to good use. In, in essence, Timothy, be consistent in your faithfulness when it's easy and when it's going well and even when it's not. I tell you, church, that's a message we all need, whether we are pastors or not. Why does summer lend itself to times of inconsistency? I think a great deal has to do with our culture, doesn't it? I mean, we tend to start things in the fall, perhaps August, perhaps September, and we we tend to end things, we tend to take a break in, in May. Or maybe in the public school system where I grew up, maybe to the first part of June right there. But, but consider it with me. From the time we are five years old, maybe four years old, we go to kindergarten during that time. We start in August, or we start maybe after Labor Day. Seems to start earlier and earlier every year, doesn't it? And then for the next 12 years or so, we're conditioned to take a break during the summer. Then we go to college for the next four years and do the same thing. Then down the road, we, we, we get married, and we maybe have kids of our own, and then eventually, what do they do? They start in the fall, and then they take a break in the summertime, and we have school drop-off and pick-up, and after-school practices and rehearsals and games, and summer comes, and we tend to take a break and relax. It's just kind of the, the way our culture is set up in their, their, in their calendar. Now, please don't misunderstand me. The truth is, we need to relax at some point this summer. So this message today in this series, it is not advocating against you taking a vacation. Church, I commend you for being faithful today. I commend you for your sweet spirit. And so many of you on a regular basis come in early to set up and stay after to tear down. But the truth is, we're usually just the, the pattern of our church of about six months in, we, we tend to, to feel it when summer hits. We, tend, we need to go to the mountains. We need to go see our family. We need to get away with our spouse for a date night, a date week or so. I hope you take those times. But the challenge for us is not to relax spiritually over this time. Not to relax spiritually over the summer. Why is the matter of consistency and, and faithfulness so important? Because we see the Bible speaks of it a great deal. And the Bible gives us many incentives to be in our places this summer. Not just for summer, but for all the seasons in our life. What are the benefits of consistency? Can I say, first of all, this morning, consistency is personally beneficial. Consistency is personally beneficial. Would you take your Bible with me, please? You don't have to keep your finger here in in Timothy. Would you turn to the book of Philippians in chapter number 4, please? Philippians chapter number 4. I want us to see a verse that, if we just quoted it, I think we'd probably be familiar with it. Maybe we've quoted it, maybe we've heard it. I think this is one of the most used verses in all the Bible. But I, I think it's probably one of the most misused verses as well. It can be taken out of context often. Philippians chapter 4, look at verse, verse number 13 with me. Paul is also the writer here. He says, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And it's very common to use this verse as a word of motivation. 
as a word of inspiration, maybe in a, a locker room setting, you know, before the championship game. We're, we can win today because we can do all things through Christ. He's going to give you the victory today. Uh, we, we, we tend to view this verse in regards of what we can achieve or what we can accomplish, of what we can do because of Christ's power. And the Bible speaks plenty about the power of God in our lives and what He can accomplish, but I'm saying that is not what this verse is all about. Because would you back up with me to verse number 10? We'll see the, the setting that Paul uses this. Verse number 10, he, he says, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again, wherein you were careful, but you lacked opportunity. He's writing from house imprisonment, and he's received an offering, some support from the Philippians, and he says, I rejoiced that you guys would sacrifice and give and think about me in my affliction. He says in verse number 11, not that I speak in respect of want, I didn't necessarily need anything, but I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry. Both to abound and to suffer need. See what he's doing? He's lifting, listing the different circumstances he's endured in his life. He says, sometimes and, and where I am and where God has me, I, I have a, a, enough to pay my bills. And he says, and other times I, I need some help from people. And he says, other times I've got food on the table. And, and he says, other times that I've, I, I don't have, I don't have a lot. He says, sometimes I've gone hungry. Sometimes I've been full. But he says, after all those things, in verse 13, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. See, he's learned whether I'm on the highest of highs, whether I'm on the lowest of lows, he's found a way to be consistent through God's grace. It's not so much about what we can do with Christ's power as much as it is about who we can be regardless of the circumstances. And that is faithful. I can be faithful. I can keep on going. I can be consistent because Christ gives me what I need. And we can be the same. And, and doing so will be incredibly beneficial for us. So what are the physical benefits of uh, consistency? Well, first of all, would you notice the benefits industrially? The benefits industrially. And if you notice this verse in your outline, if you're following along with us, the book of Proverbs says much about this. In Proverbs 13 and verse 11, Solomon says, Wealth gotten by vanity shall be diminished, but he that gathereth by labor shall increase. And so see the proverb, the, the general principle for life. That's what the Proverbs contains. It's wealth gotten by vanity. So a, a means of accumulating wealth to where they didn't necessarily earn it. You know, maybe somebody rang the doorbell and they had the giant cardboard check. You have won the lottery, American home sweepstakes, you know. Or, or maybe a, a relative passed away and left a, a six-figure inheritance. He says that kind of wealth is one that shall be diminished. Now, how does that go down? Because you do not fully appreciate that which you do not work for. And what you do not work for and earn... You do not value it as you should. And when we do not value these things, we can waste these things. Well, I guarantee you there's a difference in the young person who asks and asks and asks for an iPad just to be finally given one as a present and a difference in the per young person who does odd and in jobs around the house and it works and cutting the lawns and, and it's selling lemonade. It has to be some expensive lemonade to get an iPad, I know. But, you know, it saves up for a year, two years just to, to purchase an iPad, for example, for themselves. Boy, that's the young person that's going to value it and take care of it. I want to make sure I get a cover. Hey, don't scratch my iPad. I've had to work for this. Well, there's going to be a greater value because they've worked for it and earned it little by little consistently. Just from a 
a physical, industrial standpoint. That's the, the truth of the proverb here. There's a greater value when we are consistent to put in the work day by day. Punch in the time clock, punch out the time clock, little by little. That's how investments grow over time, don't they? $100 here, and then leave it alone. Just let it accumulate over time, over years. And the, the earlier we can instill principles of consistency in a young person's life, I believe the better. Principles of making your bed on a consistent basis brushing our teeth, doing chores throughout the summer, whatever the case is, because it's forming habits today that will be habits throughout their lifetime. And they'll be better off because of it. But not only does the proverb speak of the industrial benefits, the Bible also speaks of spiritual benefits when we are consistent. Just little by little, day in, day out, being faithful where we are, the spiritual benefits of that. Now, if you're following, we used this verse last Sunday morning. We spent a number of uh, minutes on it, but notice with me again what Hebrews chapter 5 says in verse number 13. It says, For everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. Using the analogy of somebody that is consuming the word of God, how they receive it. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. So I want us to see again the, the, this verse to remind us of the growth and benefit that comes from consistently being in the Word of God. It doesn't necessarily mean this summer we take hours and hours upon end at a time, but consistency. Day by day, little by little, every day making the decision to apply what I read, to apply what I hear from church. That's where the growth comes from, the verse says. That's where those skills are sharpened and exercised to discern good and evil. And that's not just with our Bible reading, is it? The, the same could be said about Bible memory. And think about what we could do whether we're a young person, whether we're a, a, a single adult, whether we're an older person, you say, my memory's not the greatest. Well, just think about what could be done little by little, consistently memorizing Scripture. One verse a week. One verse a week. You take a, a three-by-five card, a note card, and you write that verse out. And then the next week comes, and you, what do you do? You write out another verse. And as you're studying that one, you, you go back to that first one. So now I've got two that I'm working on. Then the next week comes and so forth. Boy, the, the nine, ten weeks of summer as you're constantly adding one a week. <laughs> Jesus wept, right? Yeah. All right, maybe a little bit longer than that. I don't know. But as, as you're constantly adding these verses, boy, by the end of summer, you could have nine, ten verses added to your memory. One verse a week. W what if we practice that for a year? Beginning of June till next June. 52 weeks, that's 52 verses constantly repeating and repetitive and learning different scriptures. And that's how we consistently pray for our missionaries on Wednesday nights, isn't it? Every Wednesday night we have a missionary of the week. We have them on a rotation. We go through our 12 missionaries and then what do we do? If week number 13, we, we go back and we go through our missionaries again. Let's pray for this family today. That's what we do with our outreach program at our church. As we go door to door, usually within about a five-mile radius of the campus here, it, it takes us about a year to get all the way around. But what do we do as we hand out gospel invitations and gospel message on the back? When we cover all the areas, what do we do? We go back to the first area, we start again. We go all the way around again, it takes about another year. We're about four times right now through. And because we've gone back again and again, now people are starting to say, Oh yeah, I've got, I remember getting something from you, church. Oh, I remember, you guys are the ones that meet in that school. So whereas the first few times around, now where do you guys meet again? Well, we're inside of a school, a oh, brand new church. We're just consistent, consistent, oh, little by little, again and again. I'm saying there's a biblical principle of success coming over the long term when we are consistent on a day-to-day -day basis. There are benefits to consistency personally, but would you also notice, secondly and lastly this morning, that consistency is publicly beneficial as well? Publicly, not just your personal benefits, but how can it benefit you in, in the public arena? We've seen already how the wisest man in the Bible, Solomon, 
emphasize consistency in the Old Testament. Now I want us to see in the New Testament how we see one of the greatest Christians who ever lived, the Apostle Paul, emphasizes this as well. And so, would you take your Bible with me? Would you turn, please, to the book of Titus? Titus in chapter number 2. It'll be close to where we started, and in Timothy right behind it. Titus is a small book right behind 2 Timothy, where we started this morning. As these are instructions to another one of Paul's preacher boys, ministering on the island of Crete, there in the Mediterranean. Titus was his name. And in Titus chapter 2, Paul is telling Titus how to lead the churches there. And he instructs him in the first part of chapter 2 to uh, what he is to teach the, what he calls the aged men, the older men, and what he is to teach the, the aged women. Why? So they can use their age and their wisdom and their influence to teach the younger men and the younger woman, women. And after all that, notice what Paul says with me in Titus chapter 2, verse number 6 and 7. He says in verse number 6, Young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded. This is what he's teaching them. In verse 7, In all things showing thyself a pattern of good works. Thyself. So Titus, here's what I want you to teach. Here's your curriculum. This is why you lead the older men and how you use them to influence the younger men. And this whole time, while you're doing that, he says, you can also teach by your life. In all things, he says, show a pattern. You, Titus, be the consistent example so they know what it looks like. So in what ways do we benefit publicly by consistency? Two ways this morning, and then we're through. First of all, we benefit by our example to others. By our example to others. We're not speaking this morning about a, a pharisaical way. We're not seeking to draw attention to ourselves. Look at me and how spiritual I am. Do what I do because I am a great Christian. That, that, that's not what he's saying there. But he is saying this. Notice, church, consistency is the best opportunity for you to show someone what the Christian life looks like. Consistency is the best opportunity for you to show someone what a Christian looks like. How you show up to work every day, even on Mondays, I know. You show up on time. You show up with a good attitude. You do your job for a full eight hours. You work with integrity and you work with ethics. Boy, that, that's what a Christian looks like? Yeah. As you go through trials and go through difficulties, and, and yet you're still in your place, you're still faithful, still serving the Lord. Wow, that's what a Christian looks like. Just little by little, consistency. What a wonderful opportunity it is. One writer put it this way, consistency is the loudest microphone you'll ever speak through to your children. It's the loudest microphone you'll ever speak through. The strongest message to others is what we do every day because that's who we are. Not necessarily what we are and who, who we look to be for an hour or two on a Sunday. It's who are we when nobody sees what we are, when our family sees us, when our co-workers see us regularly. So if consistency sends a powerful message, could we not say the same thing about inconsistency? Could we not say that that could be a rather loud microphone as well? Paul understood the importance of a right example. And that's why he reminded Timothy in 2 Timothy 3 in verse number 10. He says, Thou, Timothy, hast fully known my doctrine. I I've taught you consistently. I I've taught you what to teach. And then he says, You've known my manner of life. My, pay, my purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience. He says, you've known about my persecutions, my afflictions, which came unto me. And then he lists three cities. 2 Timothy 3, verse 11, he says, you know what happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, 
and at Lystra. In fact, you're in Titus here. Would, would you just, I want us to see this. Would you just turn back maybe a page or two? 2 Timothy 3, verse number 11. 2 Timothy 3, so we're going to connect some dots here and, and see this important truth. Verse 10, he says, you, you, knew, you knew my doctrine and my manner of life. He says in verse 11, You've known my persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. So you, you read that verse, verse 11, you say, Boy, Paul, what happened to you at those cities? I mean, what did you endure that is sticking out in the mind of Timothy? Well, the Bible tells us, you find this in Acts chapter 13 and Acts chapter 14. These three cities, they were the first place Paul went to to start churches. He and Barnabas, they were sent, we call that his first missionary journey. And so they went to Antioch, and went to Iconium, and, and the, uh, cities in the region of Galatia where we get our letter to Galatians, that letter was written to these churches. And the Bible tells us this in Acts chapter 14, that when they came to that third city in Lystra, there was a crippled man there, and Paul, through the power of Jesus, healed that man. He can now stand up and walk. And the people of Lystra said to Paul and Barnabas, they said, the gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. They thought they were Jupiter and Mercury, their gods. They said, wow, the gods have arrived. And they were picking up Paul and picking up Barnabas on their shoulders. And woohoo, bring out the, the, the animals. Bring, we're going to have a, a wonderful sacrifice. And, and Paul had to tell them, no, 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 we are like-minded men. We're, we're not gods. Well, let me tell you about the true God. Incredible moment. You talk about the high of the highs. Wow, you are like God. You know, just about three verses later, what the Bible says happens. Men from the cities of Antioch and Iconium, those two places where they were, they follow Paul and Barnabas to Lystra. They have nothing better to do. They are so mad with the Apostle Paul. First century Karens were available there, right there in the Bible. I mean, they follow this man, and the Bible says they stir up the city so much that the same people who just a moment ago were saying, wow, the gods have come down to us. You know what they do? They pick up giant stones and they hit Paul with stones and they stone him. They leave him outside the city thinking that he's dead. You think you had a, a big roller coaster day, a roller coaster week. The highest of highs, they're picking you up on your shoulders. The gods have come down to us only to say, no, we want you dead. That's what happened in Lystra. Can I just say, a good measure of your consistency. It's how we handle the highest of highs. It's how we handle the lowest of lows. It's how we handle not just our criticisms, how we handle our compliments too. And Paul's saying to Timothy in verse 11, You have seen me on my highest of highs. You've seen me on my lowest of lows. You've seen my manner of life, and you've seen me be consistent. Man, I wonder if that could be said about me. Could that be said about you? I was reading that, and I wondered. He keeps saying, Timothy, you've known this. You've, you've seen this. But the Bible says that Timothy is not on the scene yet at least not from what we read in that part of Acts. He, he's not on part of uh, Paul's missionary team at that point. It's just him and Barnabas. So how does Timothy hear about this and, and know about everything that Paul endures? Would you take your Bible to one final place this morning? Would, would you turn to Acts chapter 16, please? Acts chapter number 16. The stoning and the... The leaf being left for dead, all that happened in, in chapter 14. And so when you get to Acts 15, Paul goes back to Jerusalem and is reporting about how the Gentiles have been saved. And then beginning in Acts chapter 16, Paul is following the leading of the Lord to, to go from Jerusalem all the way over to Greece. And guess where he has to pass through to get there? The same cities where he just was. He has to pass through Iconium and Derby and Lystra, the region of Galatia. 
Notice Acts chapter 16 and verse number 1. It says, Then came he to Derby and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there. Where? Lystra. The city where Paul was raised up as a god, and then we're at the city where he was stoned and left for dead. And what was that disciple's name? A certain disciple was there named Timotheus, Timothy, the son of a certain woman which was a Jewess, but his father was a Greek, who was well reported by the brethren that were at Lystra and Iconium. Him would Paul have to go with him. So they go back to the same cities that just kicked him out and just persecuted them. And now when they come back in Acts 16, they find somebody's waiting for them. And it's Timothy. That's incredible to me. Can you see Timothy? He, he sees perhaps Paul being lifted up on the shoulders as a god. He sees Paul deflecting that. No, 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 it's not me. He sees Paul being stoned and left for dead. And then perhaps maybe a year later, he, he sees that same man come back to the same people who stoned him. What is he doing? He's preaching the same message that almost got him killed. He wants to go and preach this message to other people. He must really believe in this. I want to go with him. Well, I wonder, church, who looks at your life and says, I want what they have? Who looks at your life and says, I want what their marriage has for my marriage? Their family seems to be so put together. I want what they have. I want the harmony and peace they have in my home. I want the joy that they have. They're always so cheerful. They're consistent. My friends, consistency benefits us by our example to others. And can I say, finally this morning, we benefit publicly by our encouragement to others. Our encouragement. Hebrews chapter 10 tells us this. It'll be our final verse. You see it there in the notes. Hebrews 10 verse 24. Let us consider one another. Consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. So, so this is the verse that we use for why we go to church, isn't it? One of the main ones we use. It's the verse we use for why we come back to church. Why we, we have give the Lord the whole day on Sunday morning and, and, and Sunday night. And why we come back on Wednesday night. You say, Pastor, I'm looking at that verse. I, I don't see Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night spelled out in there. But here's what you do see. It sees the command is to not forsake the assembling. So when the assembly assembles... We're to be there and be a part of it. And this will be better received when we understand the why behind it. It's the why of verse 24. He says, let us consider one another. One of the benefits of church is not necessarily our needs, although we benefit from church ourselves. He says, we're, we're to come to church looking for how we can serve and benefit one another. How we can provoke one another to good works. How I can pray for you. How I can serve you. How I can encourage you in your faith. And so you see the benefit of being faithful and in our place at church. When I come to church, when I'm in my place, I ought to have a better capacity to serve God because of the influence of those around me. Because they were in their place. Boy, they encourage me. They support me. They come stand beside me. They pray for me. And the same is true vice versa. They should have a, a better capacity and ability to serve God because I came to church today. Because I gave them a smile and a handshake. Because I said, I'm praying for you. So glad to see you here. You know, when is that difficult? When is that impossible? It's when we're not in our place. I can't pray with you as a church. I can't cry with you. I can't encourage you. I can't serve with you if I'm not there with you. And so, church, that's why consistency matters. Oh, not just in our attendance this summer, but also in our reading, in our personal worship, in our attitudes, in our service for the Lord. Consistency 
is one of the most important spiritual disciplines we can develop in our lives. And so I challenge all of us, I challenge myself this morning, let's solidify some habits for the Lord that will not change even when the seasons do. And let's spend some time with the Lord in prayer and ask Him to help us with that today. Shall we? Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father, thank You so much for Your Word and just the practical kind of nuts and bolts type of message we've seen today. I don't think this is just our church. This wasn't meant to single out anybody or any vacation or any church specifically. I think it's just our nature. I think it's with churches across the board. We can tend to relax during the summertime. We can grow a little complacent. And so God, even though seasons do change and circumstances do change, I pray that our time with you will not change this summer. I pray that our manner of walk and manner of life will not change. For the children and grandchildren who are watching us, for the co-workers who are watching us and knowing that we are a Christian, we may be